section in the Revelation that is entitled, The Seven Blanks. Trumpets, very good. We're in the section called The Seven Trumpets. Uh, we are in the last three of those trumpets, okay? And that section could be called The Three Woes. Very good. So, The Three Woes and The Last Three Trumpets are the same, okay? Are exactly the same thing. So don't get, uh, you know, discouraged by that. These trumpets are the announcement of what? The trumpets are the announcement. Maybe, let me refer. The trumpets are the announcement of God's blank. What is it? Yes, His wrath or His judgment upon... It depends on what date of the book of Revelation you choose, right? Okay? But uh, uh, it could be on the city of Jerusalem. Okay? Uh, if, it, if it's not, then it's on the empire of Rome, is it not? So it's one of those two groups of individuals. Um, we are in the sixth trumpet, and we're almost through with it. And there are three big things that transpire at the very close of the sixth trumpet. One of those is the uh, measurement of the temple. Okay, And basically all God is doing is, is He is uh, measuring out His own people in order to keep them safe from judgment. Okay, folks, God is not going to destroy His own. If you are faithful, if you are steadfast, if you are obedient, if you have done His will, guess what? He knows you, and He will protect you, and you will not fall in the judgment. You will be preserved, okay? Um, the second section is where we are right now, and that is the section known as the two witnesses. Okay, the two witnesses. Witnesses. And uh, these two witnesses are prophets, aren't they? Okay, that's what they've been given the power and the ability to do is to prophesy. And in the first century, if you were a prophet, not only did you have the ability to prophesy, but you also had what other kind of ability? What's that? Yes, but uh, um, the power of miracles, so that you can confirm the words that you're speaking, okay? And we've talked about the power that these two men had. The Bible says they could shut up heaven. They could turn water into blood. They could bring plagues upon the nations, couldn't they? So they had the same abilities as Moses and Elijah of the Old Testament. They were just as powerful. They occupied the same position as prophets as those men did. Okay? Uh, possibly, yes. Yeah, I mean, you find uh, um, the Old Testament prophets healed. Uh, they raised the dead. There, there was a lot of different powers that they were given that were miraculous at that particular uh, point in time. Okay? Um, now, true or false? Um, the nation to whom these two men are witnessing and prophesying, they just love these men, don't they? No. They despise these men, right? And we learned last lesson that individuals rose up and what did they do to them? They killed them and just left their bodies lying in the streets, didn't they? Okay, and that's kind of where we closed last time in the lesson. Okay, um, we, we, we named the city. The city was referred to by the names of Sodom and Egypt. Sodom and Egypt. Remember, Sodom due to its uh, extreme immorality and Egypt due to its rebellion against the Almighty God. Okay, so those two pictures... Um, are the same for this city. And it's also referred to as the city in which Jesus, what? Was crucified. Folks, what city is that? That's the city of Jerusalem. Okay? So, it, you know, it, it's hard for you to say, well, this isn't Jerusalem. Some commentators do. 
And yet, he says, it's the city in which the Lord was crucified. Folks, that city is Jerusalem. Okay? Uh, that's where Jesus was crucified. Um, so we have these individuals who, once um, these prophets die, what do they begin to do? What, what, what does the city do? That's where we are right now. Okay? Uh, notice point number 12 there. And they, and they of the people and kindred and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to what? To be put in the graves. Folks, the ones that killed them, the rulers, didn't allow them to be buried. And all the people that were in the city didn't allow these men to be buried. Does anybody remember why that was the case? Why didn't they bury these men? Why didn't they give them a proper burial? Why did they just leave them laying out there in the city? Huh? Okay, number one, to show who was truly the powerful ones, right? Ah, uh, yes, to strike fear into the hearts of anybody who wanted to follow these prophets, right? Uh, if you want to follow them, this will be your end. So they were out there to teach lessons to the people, weren't they? And so they refused to uh, bury the bodies of these three individuals. Now notice that they shall see their bodies how long? Three and a half days. Three and a half days. Now, as we concluded last time, I said, go home and do some study on what? Three and a half days. Right? So every one of you understand the importance of three and a half days, and you're going to tell me what that means. Oh, Vic, I forgot. It was Christmas, and you know, things had come up. Okay? Three and a half days. Turn to John eleven thirty nine 39 for a moment. John eleven thirty nine. 39. John 11. Anybody know what that chapter deals with? John 11? Nobody. Read your Bible more. <laughs> it is the resurrection of Lazarus. The resurrection of Lazarus. Okay? And Jesus finally arrives at the home of Mary and Martha. And notice what transpires. And Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. Now listen to this next statement. For he hath been dead four days. They didn't embalm like we embalm. Okay? Not the Jews. Now the Egyptians did, didn't they? But the Jews didn't embalm like we did, right? And so they buried the body very quickly. And notice what Martha says. Martha says, Lord, it's been four days. By now, he what? He stinketh. Now, folks, when you're at Walmart and you're out in public sometimes and you smell some of these folks that hadn't taken baths, you know what we call that, don't you? We call that Lazarus Syndrome. Okay? He stinketh. You need to teach two and three year olds to say that. Okay? Because uh, sometimes, you know, two and three year olds, they're pretty blunt, aren't they? Man, mom, he stinks. No, darling, no, darling. He has Lazarus Syndrome. Okay? Because I guarantee you, they won't have a clue what that means. <laughs> um, about the fourth day, folks, the dead usually began to decompose and the dead began to stink. Okay, Notice, these prophets had only been dead three and a half days. Corruption, corrosion, decomposition had not yet set in on these bodies. Okay, Pretty good, isn't it? Second point, the rabbis in Judaism had a belief that was very common among them, okay? And the belief was that on the fourth day, the Spirit finally 
departed and went into the Hadean realm. Now, they believe that the spirit separated from the body, but they believe that spirit hovered over that body for what? For three days. And the fourth day, guess what? Gone. So in other words, anything was possible those first what? First three days, right? The person might what? Might revive, might be. Okay, and that, that was kind of in their mind. But after that fourth day, it's over. There is no hope of resurrection. Okay, you are dead as a doornail. Okay, after what? On that fourth day. Okay, these men have been dead what? Three and a half days. Still possible for what? Resurrection. Okay, so it could be possibly that he's confronting that Jewish thinking. Okay, uh, so you've got no, no decomposition of the bodies, right? And the ability of the spirit to what? To enter back into this non-decomposed body. So three and a half days. There's another idea about this three and a half days. Okay. If the text had said, these men were dead seven days, is there any significance to the number seven? It's a perfect number, isn't it? Okay. If they had been dead seven days, guess what? No coming back. They are perfectly, completely dead. There is no retrieving of them. These guys have only been dead, what? Half of seven. Imperfect. An imperfect number, okay? So not a perfect number, an imperfect number to represent the death of these two witnesses, okay? So uh, all, all of these ideas just indicate what? That these men can what? Be revived. They can come back from the dead. They can be resurrected again. Okay, three and a half days. Very, very interesting. Now notice what happens when they see these men dead for these three and a half days. Verse 10, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Oh, guys, we got enough material to talk for the rest of the night right here. Okay, we ain't going to make it very far. Okay. There is a festive spirit on the earth when those who proclaim the truth have been what? Put to death. Right? I've seen congregations who have fired preachers because they preach the truth. Okay. And when the preacher finally loads up his moving van and pulls out of town, Guess what there is in the church? A festive spirit. They almost have a fellowship meal. When a church has a fellowship meal, that's a big deal, isn't it? Okay? That means what? That means something wonderful's going on. We finally got rid of that old boy. And there is a festive spirit. Folks, error, wickedness, sin, hates truth. Doesn't it? And when truth finally appears to have been put to death, what does evil do? They rejoice. And the text says that. They rejoice. They make merry. And they send gifts one to another. Turn your Bibles to John 16. John 16. Jesus is in the upper room with His disciples and He's teaching them some things before He's finally going to be put to death. Okay? And he makes some interesting statements. And sometimes we read statements and we don't think about what Jesus says. Okay? John 16, beginning verse 19. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask Him and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while and ye shall not see me? And again, a little while, and ye shall see me. Almost like a rhyme, isn't it? Hey guys, guess what? In a little while, 
You're not going to see me. And in a little while, you are going to see me. What's he talking about? Now put both of them in there. He's talking about death and resurrection. In a little while, you are not going to see me. Why? I'm going to be put to death. But in a little while, you what? You will see me because guess what? I'll be raised. Now, you know, if Jesus is just conversing with you and says that to you, you're going, well, what are you talking about, Willis? Right? And that's what he confronts, isn't it? And that's what he asks them. He says, do ye inquire among yourselves that I said this? Now notice what he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. What are they going to rejoice at, folks? The death of Jesus. During that time when you cannot see me, you will lament and you will weep, but the world will what? Will rejoice. Can you imagine? Those Jewish leaders who had taken Jesus to Pontius Pilate, okay, the Sanhedrin court, at least 72 Jews. Okay, we only know two of them uh, that did not agree with the decision. Does anybody know who they are? Nicodemus and Joseph. Neither one of those consented unto the death of Jesus, the Bible says. So approximately 70 men consented to His death. Can you imagine when Jesus finally gave up the ghost, died on the cross of Calvary, and they gave that body to Joseph to go be buried, and they went home that night? What do you think they felt like? Oh man, hallelujah! The blasphemer, the old son of God, he's dead. Can you imagine? They shall what? The world shall rejoice. Now notice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but... Your sorrow shall be turned into what? Into joy. When was that? When He came forth from the grave the third day. Okay? So that's what He's talking about in that text. Questions, comments? Do you have something, Larry? No? Okay. <clears throat> now, so the world rejoices when it appears that truth has been silenced. Okay? Now notice another statement that John makes, okay? It's in the second part of the verse. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwell upon the earth. Ah. That little word torment means this, to torture. Thayer says it means to torture. To vex with grievous pains of body or mind. To be, har to be harassed, distressed. Gospel preachers torment people. And the church said, Amen! Every Sunday. <laughs> that boy gets in that pulpit and just torments the stink out of us. Okay? Isn't that an interesting word? These two witnesses tormented them that dwell on the earth. They caused them grief. They caused them pain. They caused them distress. They caused them anguish of mind. Folks, truth agitates evil. Doesn't it? And that's what he's talking about. Brother Waycaster makes this statement. There is a sense in which God's Word and God's people torment those that live in sin it is not, of course, out of a sense of joy or pleasure that the faithful of God torment those living in sin. It is rather a simple fact that the proclamation of God's Word exposes the darkness of sin in the lives of those who would oppose God and His church. I've had more than one person get mad at me for preaching the truth. It used to bother me. It doesn't bother me near as bad as it used to. They don't like it, but it doesn't bother me nearly as bad because they're really not rejecting me. Who are they rejecting? They're rejecting God, aren't they? They're rejecting God. Turn your Bibles to 1 Kings 18, verse 17. Somebody gets there, just read that verse for us. 1 Kings 18, 17. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You're right.
Ah, there it is. Now, who's the evil one in the text? Ahab. He's the old wicked king of Israel, is he not? And the prophet is who? Elijah. And the very minute Ahab lays eyes on Elijah, he says, Art thou he that troubleth Israel, you troublemaker? And see, that's what happens, folks. When a preacher preaches truth and trouble gets stirred up in a congregation because people get agitated at the truth, guess who gets blamed for causing trouble? The preacher. Well, look at you. What you stirring up, why aren't you stirring up this congregation for by your preaching? Read the next verse. There's a smart aleck preacher in it. I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, because you violated the command of God. Boy, you know, oh Ahab, I mean Elijah, he didn't take the junk, did he? You know, he didn't just take it sitting down. He opposed the man. He let him know real quick, I'm not the troublemaker here, you are. You follow God's commandment, you do what God wants you to do, guess what? We'll have peace and harmony here. You don't want to do that, guess what? We're going to have trouble. It's not going to be my because of me. It's because of who? It's because of you. Turn over to 1 Kings 20 verse 43. Somebody read that one. Man. The king of Israel went to his house heavy and what? Displeased. You want to know why? Because a prophet had just spoken to him. And he didn't like the message. Amos 5.10 says this, They hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. Turn over to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Somebody read verses 51 through 54. Acts 7, 51 through 54. Stop. Stop real quick. I, I, I've been meaning to do this. I've been preaching 40 years, and I've never preached a lesson that I said I'm going to preach. And the lesson is titled something like this. I've never preached like Bible preachers preached. Okay? Now, I want you to think about this. Here is Stephen, a Jew, a faithful Jew, but he's a Christian. Okay? He's standing before the Jewish council. And here's what he says. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ain't never called nobody that. I've never looked at anybody and said, You want to know what's wrong with you? You got uncircumcised ears. <laughs> Boy, wouldn't that, wouldn't that chap somebody? That's some pretty strong words. Okay? It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, it just, it just sounds bad, doesn't it? You know? And, uh, but, but my, my, my point is this. You know, even though I may preach strong sometimes, guess what, folks? I've never preached as strong as some of these individuals. Take, for instance, Jesus. Jesus looked at the Jews on one occasion and said, You brood of vipers! That's, that's pretty strong language, isn't it? I've never called anybody a snake. Okay? Well, it doesn't matter what they think. All, all I'm saying is, is that because of our society and the way we are, we tone down the message now rather than being as forceful sometimes as some used to preach the Word in times past. They were strong, okay? And they used very strong terminology and very strong language to get their message across to individuals. So keep reading now. So, so here he is. He's confronted them. Keep going.
Ah, boy. Isn't that a wonderful reaction? Now, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Folks, wouldn't you like to have been there and heard the cursing going on? They were not happy campers. Jump down to verse 57. Keep going. There you go. Guys, what did they finally do to him? They killed him, didn't they? Took him out of the city, killed him. Okay? So I guess what we've learned, we as preachers have learned, that there's so far you can go before they'll kill you. <laughs> you know, if I start calling you stiff-necked and uncircumcised uh, in heart and ears, well, guess what? You may stake me out and kill me. So I don't call you any names. Um, I wouldn't want to be stoned. But the whole point is, is that what? Folks, the gospel message, God's message, God's word has always tormented the wicked, hasn't it? And the way they respond to that message is what? To lash out at the messenger and do all they can do to get rid of him. They did the prophets of the Old Testament. They did Jesus. They did Stephen. They've done it now to these two witnesses, haven't they? Yes, ma'am. You need to. Sometimes it, but it, but it creates problems, doesn't it? You know, and it, it creates you know stirs in congregations and stuff, and and we don't we don't like that kind of stuff. But you're right; it needs to be confronted as quickly as possible, and uh, it's it's not easy to do. So now we've got two dead prophets, don't we? And the world is what? The world is rejoicing. They're just tickled to death. Verse eleven. And after three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. It's almost like a soap opera, isn't it? You know? One verse, and everything's radically altered, isn't it? One show, that's all you got to watch in a soap opera. And everything's radically altered. Okay? Here the world is rejoicing for three and a half days. They're just so happy. And then all of a sudden they look out their window and guess what? There's two guys who are alive again. Wow. I wrote down this statement. Two definitions are manifested in this one verse. Okay? Two definitions are manifested in this one verse. The first definition is the definition of death. Okay? Death. How do we define death? Somebody just define it for me. Anybody got a simple definition? Okay, cessation of life. That's a good definition. Ah, spirit leaves the body. Okay? James 2, verse 26. For as the body... Without the Spirit is what? Dead. Guys, go back to verse 8. And notice that there are dead, what does it say? Bodies lying where? Lying in the street. And guess what? The Spirit ain't there. Is it? That's terrible English. The Spirit isn't there. And then we get down to verse 11, and what do we find? Now we find the Spirit of life, what? Enters into those bodies. We've got some individuals who teach that when you die, you just sleep. Okay? You just sleep. It's called the doctrine of soul sleep. 
Okay, folks, this, this passage right here destroys that. Okay? It's likened unto sleep because it looks like a person sleeping, doesn't it? You ever walked up and seen somebody lying in a casket and you say, boy, doesn't he look restful? Or maybe you just almost say it. He looks like he's asleep. Okay? So death resembles a sleep, but it's not sleep, is it? It's different than that because death is what? The separation of the spirit from the body. Now notice what has to happen in order for this, for this body to live again. The spirit has to do what? has to come back into that body, doesn't it? Okay? It has to come back into the body. So, death is defined as the separation of the spirit and body. And it does result in the cessation of life, doesn't it? Okay? Now, the second definition. You ready? Resurrection. Resurrection. Notice what the text says. Okay? And they stood upon their feet. That's resurrection, folks. Okay? I want you to think about something. I'm walking down the aisle here, and I have a massive heart attack. What happens to me? I fall flat on my face. I'm just laid out, right? And then the Lord resurrects me. He causes me to... Stand again, doesn't he? Folks, the literal definition of the word resurrection is that. To stand again. You go into the funeral home, you see somebody lying in a casket, and guess what he is? He's lying in the casket, isn't he? He is not going to stay that way. He is going to be resurrected. He is going to stand again. Okay? What did Jesus say in John 5, 28 and 29? Marvel not at this. For hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There is coming a day wherein all men will stand again. Death is not the end. You will stand again. And these two prophets did, didn't they? In the Greek language, the word spirit in this verse is pneuma. Okay? Who cares, preacher? I don't know Greek. Okay? Here's what I want you to understand. When the Bible says Holy Spirit, it is Holy Pneuma. Okay? When the Bible says death is the separation of the Spirit from the body, it is the separation of the pneuma from the body. In the Greek language, the word pneuma is not ever capitalized. There are no capital letters in the Greek New Testament. Okay? So guess who makes the determination as to whether the word spirit should be capitalized or not capitalized? Who makes that determination? The translators. Okay, the translators do. In this text, is it capitalized or is it lowercase? Huh? What is it? I don't know the difference, teacher. It's been so long since I've been to school. Is it capitalized or lowercase? It's capitalized. Sometimes. The translators miss it. Not very often, but they miss it. Those th here it should be lowercase spirit. Whose spirit is being put back into these men? It's not the Holy Spirit being put into them. It's their own personal spirit. When they died, their spirit left, right? To stand again, their spirit has to what? enter back into their body. The Spirit of life from God came back into these men. Here it's, if you look at the context, it ought to be lower case spirit, not capital spirit. It is not the Holy Spirit that enters into these individuals. It is their own personal spirit. When you and I are resurrected from the grave in the last day, 
Guess whose spirit is coming back in us? Ours. Our spirit is coming back into us. When we die, where does our spirit go? It goes to the Hadean realm. It goes to the unseen realm of the dead. Right? And then, when our Lord comes again, guess what He's going to do? Everybody that's in the Hadean realm, He's bringing back with them, and those spirits are going to be reunited with what? Those bodies, and those bodies are going to come out of the grave. That's resurrection. Now the only difference is that that body is going to be what? Changed, isn't it? It's going to become a spiritual body. Was that the second bell? First bell, good. We've got 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm just messing. Here's the lesson. Individuals who proclaim the gospel can be put to death. The cause of Christ can be stunned for a short period of time, but the preaching of the gospel and the spread of the church cannot be halted by God's enemies. The three and a half days is half of seven. Thus, this is an incomplete victory instead of a complete one. You can't kill the truth, folks. You can't stop the spread of the truth. And I don't care how hard God's enemies want to do it, it will not happen. Can you imagine how Pontius Pilate felt when he got news that the body of Jesus was no longer in that tomb? Can you imagine how the Jews felt when they got that news? Were they bent out of shape? Oh yeah. Enough to collude with the Roman soldiers to tell a lie about what happened, didn't they? I'd love to have seen the city of Jerusalem that Sunday morning, wouldn't you? About 10 o'clock. There's people going to be nuts so that day. I'll guarantee you. They couldn't, could not believe it. Upon seeing the resurrected prophets, great fear came upon them which saw them. These are the ones who rejoiced, who made merry, who gave gift to one another. And now what happens? They are filled with great fear. Don't miss the words. They are filled with great fear. Their joy was turned into fear. The word fear there is the Greek word phobos. It is the Greek word from which we get the word Phobia, very good, right? Phobias, fears of, okay? Fears of. To be put in fear, alarm, fright, fear, dread, terror, that which strikes terror. Folks, when they looked out their window, when they were walking down the street and the two witnesses passed them, now standing, guess what happened? There weren't no more joy. There was nothing but what? terror in the hearts of those individuals. Men of the world often think that they are fighting against other men. Not so. They're fighting against God. They can kill all they desire to kill. God, however, can restore to life again. Folks, you can't beat who? You can't beat God. It's an impossibility. Good stuff. I told you we wouldn't get to it all, but we, we got some. Thank you, thank you. We'll crank it up next week.